What you need to know about retirement presented by members of the JCCC Retirees Association, JCCCRA. Welcome to the session. I think you'll find it very interesting and very exciting. Thank you. Through the approaching retirement uh, is an exciting time. I know it is for all of you. It's important to retire to something, not just retire. Travel, volunteering, second career, not just retire from your current employment. It's going to get exciting. It's going to be a little scary. But taking classes, volunteering, hobbies, or others are an important aspect of it. Don't let it speak up to you. It's an important lifestyle uh, from going back to work every day. You can sleep in late, too. Thank you. First of all, thank you for the opportunity to speak to the JCCCRA today. Uh, it's always been a pleasure of mine. Uh, it's uh, the Retiree Association that 10 years ago uh, convinced me that uh, a lifetime of uh, work at Johnson County Community College can pay off uh, rather handsomely at retirement. And I hope those of you that have retired have found that to be the case. But at any rate, uh, I wanna talk a little bit about uh, what you need to know if you haven't retired yet. And uh, the nice thing about this slide that Jonathan's put together is that uh, uh, we are still uh, in, in business here at Human Resources. Uh, you wouldn't know it to walk into the office, but we are here. And uh, as you think about uh, getting ready to retire, uh, we're still available to meet with you either uh, mask to mask or uh, via Zoom or over the phone to talk about the things that are important to you. Um, many of you are probably aware that uh, we have the Voluntary Employment Retirement Benefit, uh, the acronym VERB, which is uh, an opportunity for you to turn some of your sick leave into uh, real dollars at your retirement. Uh, and the most important thing you need to remember about that is we need six months prior notice, unless you're a faculty member and then the faculty association agreement provides that uh, those particular notifications either happen prior to December 1st, if you're going to leave at the end of the spring semester and May the 1st, if you're going to leave at the end of the fall semester. But at any rate, uh, all the benefit specialists are still here and the benefit manager to help you if you've got questions about uh, what uh, may be the best time for you to retire and the kinds of things that uh, you can look forward to in terms of financial remuneration. Next slide, Jonathan. One of the things uh, for those of you who haven't retired yet uh, that you need to be aware of is that um, the CAPERS calculator does a pretty doggone good job of uh, giving you a, a sort of a, a 90 10 idea of what you might be able to, to uh, collect uh, retirement time from CAPERS. Uh, I suspect, no, I strongly tell you that I, we can do better than that if you want to come to us before you retire and ask us to do it. Uh, and especially those of you who have a CAPERS uh, date, uh, participation date prior to July 1st of 93, because uh, you have some real options in terms of what you can do with your VERB benefit that those of us who came to CAPERS after that time do not have. The other thing is you're going to want to at least have an idea of what to do uh, or what you're going to get from Social Security if you're old enough. And, and uh, Jonathan's done a good job here of uh, letting you know uh, where you can go to get that. Uh, I think that's important. Uh, okay, so when you are plan for retirement, consider the tax impact. CAPERS retirement benefits are not taxable on the Kansas return, but they are on your federal tax return. If you retire to another state, CAPERS payments may be taxable on both the state and the federal returns. But Social Security payments, regardless of filing status, are not taxable so long as your federally federal adjusted gross income, that's AGI, is $75,000 or less. Required minimum distributions, we refer to that as RMDs, from TIAA are other 403B or 401K accounts are taxable on both state and federal returns. The SECURE Act, which stands for Setting Every Community Up for Retirement Enhancement, which was passed in 2019, made a big change to the RMD requirements by extending the age from 70 and a half to 72 
And under this new, these new rules, if you turn 70 on July 1st of 2019 or later, you don't have to take an RMD for 2019. Instead, you must take your first RMD for 2021, the year you turn 72, by April 1st of 2022. This means your money can now linger a little bit longer in a tax deferred account. The extended April 1st deadline only applies to your very first RMD withdrawal and subsequent RMDs are due by December 31st of each year for that year. Now, keep in mind, you could take two distributions in the first year that your R&D kick in, one on April 1st for the prior year, one on December 31st for the current year, but you will still be taxed on your total income that year. Also, the IRS penalty for not withdrawing your RMDs by December 31st is 50% of the total amount you're required to withdraw. So it's very, very important to pay attention to that and make sure you withdraw the proper amount of your RMDs by December 31st. These RMD rules apply to retirement accounts, including traditional IRAs, simplified employee pensions, that's SEP, IRAs, saving incentive match plan for employees, simple IRAs, 401ks, nonprofit 403bs, government 457 plans, profit sharing plans, and other defined contribution plans. However, for Roth IRAs, which are funded with after tax uh, dollars, don't require RMDs until, until after the owner uh, dies. If you're still working in your 70s and have a traditional 401k or another defined contribution plan through your employer, you may be able to defer your RMDs until April 1st of the year after you stop working. There is an RMD loophole for charitable contributions if you're concerned about having to take an RMD and pay the tax and, and you're in a position to make a charitable deduction. Consider giving a portion of the RMD payout directly to charity. You won't get a charitable deduction on your tax return, but your contribution will be excluded from your taxable income. Very important here. You must direct that IRA custodian to make the check directly to the charity. If it's made out to you, it will count as taxable income, even if you turn around and donate the money to charity. The IRS calls this a qualified charitable contribution, a QCD, and it only works for IRAs, not 401ks and other plans. So consider the tax consequences. Um, as Jerry's mentioned, there, or, there are, um, you may find yourself in a much better financial state as a retired person than you would have ever imagined. Okay. Next slide. Oh, by the way, I should have mentioned, I'm Phil Wegman. I was program director of continuing ed in the transportation division. I was with the college 45 years. Okay, next slide. Hi, everyone. I'm Lynn Knudsen, former Dean of Academic Support. I retired in 2016. And I'd like to give you some information about signing up for Medicare. There's a lot to learn about Medicare and you'll need to carefully weigh the options to determine which plan is best for you. To make things easier, Medicare has a website, medicare.gov, that will give you a lot of information about the various Medicare options. You're going to use this site to sign up for Medicare and also to select your health and your drug plans. Uh, on this site is a book um, called Medicare and You, and it's available in e-format to anyone on their site. Once you're enrolled in Medicare, you'll receive a copy of this book every year that will include any of the changes to the Medicare plans and coverages. You may opt to re receive this only in e-format if you wish. So here's a basic overview of Medicare plans. Medicare has multiple parts, A, B, C, and D. Part A is for hospital coverage and there's no charge for most people. It's wise to sign up for Part A as soon as you turn 65, regardless of your retirement date, unless you need more quarters to reduce or eliminate any premium. Part B is for medical expenses such as doctor visits, labs, medical tests, etc. There is a charge to you for Part B and it's based on your adjusted gross income from two years ago. So for example, 
If you sign up for Medicare in 2021, they will look at your AGI from 2019 to determine how much you will pay. These amounts are updated annually and the look back is always two years prior. The premium for Part B will be deducted from your social security check unless you've uh, decided to delay the start of your social security to a later date. If you delay, you will then have to pay the premium out of your own funds uh, until you start your social security. And then you'll be billed for three months at a time at that point. Medicare Part B pays for 80% of approved Medicare charges. Part C is Medicare Advantage. It's based on the plan you choose. You may pay the same premium as Part B based on your AGI plus a premium for the plan you select. And then lastly, Part D is for prescription medications. You will pay a fee for your Medicare drug plan to the insurer. And if you have a higher AGI, you will also pay an income related monthly adjustment amount called the IRMA that will be deducted also from your social security check. So in deciding what plans to choose, you'll need to consider your health status where you normally receive your health care and how much you travel. If you choose traditional Medicare, which is parts A and B, you'll need to sign up for a Medicare supplement plan called Medigap, which will pay the 20% that part B doesn't cover. Traditional Medicare works anywhere in the United States where Medicare is accepted and does not require prior authorization in most cases. Medicare Advantage plans are structured more like an HMO and managed care, where you need to use their doctors, their hospitals, but you may also receive dental and vision care and prescription drugs. You may also need prior approval to see a specialist. You are allowed to change your Medigap insurer during open enrollment, but a quick word of caution, when you first sign up for a Medigap policy, you will have to answer some health questions. But if you want to switch to another insurer later, you may have to answer over 100 health questions. Plus, they use a service that compiles all the medications that you've taken over the last five years. And that's a big determining factor in whether or not the other company will take you and then how much they will charge you for your premium. You can switch from traditional Medicare to Medicare Advantage and vice versa. But switching back again may be problematic for that very reason, they may not want you back. So choose wisely the first time, take a look at their premium history and their ratings on medicare.gov. Because social security and Medicare work hand in glove, I would start with a consultation at the social security office in Lenexa. Mm -hmm. You have to call for an appointment and I would ask for Sean Gifford. He's actually a friend of the college, he's done classes for us. And um, he's very good and he'll help you decide when to start your social security. His number is 877-898-4705, extension 28310. If you elect to delay your social security payments past 65, you will get more money, especially if you wait until age 70. Just a reminder that if you do this, you will have to pay your Medicare Part B premiums for three months at a time directly from your own pocket. Second, make an appointment with our SHIC office in Olathe to help you select your Medigap and Part D insurance carriers. SHIC is Senior Health Insurance Counseling for Kansas and it's a free service. Their number is 800-860-5260. Or you can contact a Medicare insurance broker there are many of them and there is also no charge to you for this service. Or find a good person to help you, maybe a friend who's already been through the process before and knows a lot about it. Or if you'd rather do it on your own, just go to medicare.gov, create an account for yourself and click on find health and drug plans. JCCCRA is also planning to offer a session on signing up for Medigap plans and Medicare Advantage. So you can look forward to that. Thank you, I hope this was helpful. And next slide. Well, good afternoon, everybody. This is uh, Dave Ellis. Uh, I was the counselor in the counseling center for 30 years and it's 
good to see some of my old friends. It's it's great, and I'm, I'm glad you're thinking about retirement. And uh, so, one of the nice things about retirement is the fact that you get to have a month or two just to, just to relax a little bit, and you get to have a chance to slow down. And that's sometimes it's kind of difficult for all of us because we've been working so long. But that's what that first month is going to be like. And and you'll probably a lot of you will probably have a chance to watch a lot of Netflix or sleep in or stay up late, read a book, take a short vacation, go out and eat more. That's pretty normal. It's pretty, just, just relax a little bit and take it easy. I know that I had a lot of things I wanted to do and I retired, but I said, I'm not gonna do those yet until I've been away for a month or two to be able to, to do those. We also want you to try, you know, we want you to try to do some different activities during, during the year. Um, I've balanced a lot of my activities of what I've done and first of all, I joined the, the retirement group, the JCCRA. What a great group. We, I've gone on museum visits. I've gone out to eat and, and gone to lectures. Uh, again, we would encourage all of you to do that. All of you to join that for, for the $100 that you need to pay to, to do that. Um, I've had a chance to be involved with four different mentoring activities I'm doing now. I, I love being around people. So I'm mentoring four different people and four different kinds of things that I'm doing. I'm teaching a class at the Johnson County uh, Detention Center. It's something I enjoy doing. But again, uh, these are all the things I've, 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 I've been, enjoyed doing even when I was counseling, so I'm doing them again now. But one of the things is you just have to balance it out. And one of the things, I, my word of advice to all of you uh, as you go through this is that if you do volunteer, make sure you don't volunteer so much that you can't get away if you wanna go on vacation. That's very important to me. That's a, that's a good you know, point that I want to make to you all. And even my, my class that I'm teaching, I asked the people, I said, if I want to go on vacation, uh, can I go? And they say, no problem. And I, if they told me I couldn't do that or couldn't go, I wouldn't have taken it because I really want to do things that I can do where I can still take a vacation. So um, Debbie and Anita are going to be talking more and more about some activities and volunteering that you, that you can do. Um, you know, another a couple other things that might just happen really quick is that um, people, if you have grandchildren, uh, your your kids will know when you retired, and and they'll start calling just to kind of let you know some of that. And also, your spouse needs to get adjusted to your retirement too. When you're if you're a spouse and married, needs to get adjusted to your when you being home. So again, um, thanks again for for every everybody being here and. Um, I think we'll go to the next slide. I think it's Anita Tebby. Thanks. Yeah, good afternoon again. I'm Anita Tebby, and I am um, formerly with the paralegal program. I was with it for 28 years, uh, wonderful years, and I retired five years ago, and I recommend it to everybody. It's a wonderful, wonderful new chapter in your life. Uh, what I want to talk to you about or share with you, and again, thank you for coming, is um, how to keep your mind active. And um, we do this all the time and we don't really realize it. It is, we're all lifelong learners. We do it by the books we read, by the TV shows we watch, the lectures we go to, just the conversations we have. And what I wanna talk about specifically is three ways that we can keep our mind fresh and, and alive and well. And that is by taking classes, by teaching classes and by going on trips. And the first one on taking classes, and I wanna specifically talk about Johnson County Community College because that of course is, is the link that we all share. And I am a, a person that loves taking classes and I take classes for credit. And in doing that, and I've done that since uh, the semester that I re uh, retired, I've taken everything from religion classes, philosophy classes, econ classes. And uh, this past semester I took an introduction to music class and also American Lit class part one. And I'm so excited because in the spring I will be taking American Lit class two. And if we didn't appreciate our colleagues, we certainly do if we take classes from them. Just amazing, amazing professors that we have at Johnson County Community College. 
One of the many uh, advantages of retiring from Johnson County Community College is that you get tuition assistance if you take classes for credit. And that means exactly what it says. If you uh, work there for 10 years and you retired, uh, you can take classes and it will be paid for. And it used to be that you uh, had to pay the class yourself and then you uh, was, were reimbursed. But now it's called tuition assistance. All you do is fill out a form with human services. They okay it, send it to the financial and it is paid for right up front. So there's no exchange of money on your part. Uh, just an incredible uh, advantage to all of us that love to learn and that's why we were in education so long. Um, the other thing I wanted to talk about is in taking classes is there just so many groups out there that are for 50 and older people that uh, many of us follow in, in fact, probably all of us. And the group that I've gotten associated with is OSHER, O-S-H-E-R, as you can see on the screen. And um, they're a lifelong learning uh, group and they're connected with University of Kansas. And I love to take classes from them. And I have the spring catalog here and you can go online and get it. And I was just glancing before I came on and the ghost towns of Kansas is being offered in February. Um, the um, ancient uh, Psalms are, is being offered another class and a third one, the psychology of grief and loss. So just huge, huge um, classes uh, offering. Uh, it does cost money, it's $50 a class. Um, you have three sessions, they're an hour and a half. So basically you're paying for um, you know, uh, four and a half hours, you're getting um, paying $50. Um, and uh, they're now all done virtually. And um, I have taken numerous ones of their classes and I uh, have not had a bad experience. In fact, I'd say I've had excellent experiences. The other uh, second thing that I was talking about was teaching classes. And, and I'm glad that um, Dave mentioned, um, we have over 200 members in JCCRA, Retirement Association, and we share our expertise with one another. And it's inexhaustible. And, um, and I, I don't wanna um, miss anybody, but you know, it take us for me forever to mention everybody, but Jonathan does such a good job with teaching us more and more in depth about technology. Um, uh, uh, Dick Stein does it with photography, Julaine does it with genealogy. Uh, you could just be taking classes all the time uh, with these uh, people. Um, then um, the um, teaching of classes, and it, this is just the reverse. Uh, not only do I take classes from Osher, but I also um, um, uh, teach classes. And um, it's volunteer. Um, they used to give a $200 stipend, but because of the COVID, they've had to cut back on that. And they're virtual. And um, again, uh, you teach three classes, uh, th you know, and so on February 12th, I'll start a new session. It's on citizenship. And, and so you teach an hour and a half. And then on um, February 19th, the second session, and then finish it up on February 27th. Um, but again, go online and look at the OSHER things. Um, the last thing that I wanted to talk about was the trips. And I'm a huge advocate of Road Scholar, R-O-A-D. And that used to be I, uh, Elder Hostel, and, uh, which was started in 1975 for retired people to go on trips. And they've expanded and also changed their name to Road Scholar. And they have in just immense and very valuable trips to take. I always focus on the grandparent grandchildren trips. And so when my grandchildren and they, I have, I'm blessed with five of them from the ages of 10 to 15, turn 10, I take them on a special trip. And so now I'm on the fifth, my last grandchild, and he wants to go to Sonoma in the California area. And we're going to go on quote, a safari. Now, I'm, I think what it amounts to is going to a wild animal kingdom and looking at animals and, and the advantage of this, and it is pricey, um, it's not a cheap uh, adventure, but you go with other grandchildren and so the children you know, have fun with each other, you go with grandparents. 
Um, they pay for everything, you know, the room, the board, the meals, the transportation uh, during the trip. Uh, it has just been the most delightful thing that I ever discovered. And to have five days with your grandchild and, and special bonding, uh, it's, I, I can't rave enough about it. Um, so um, that would be something that I would recommend. I know a lot of you do travel. I've seen your wonderful pictures um, that uh, Jonathan and, and Dick have shown us uh, through some of the presentations. But those are the three things that I would emphasize, the taking of classes, the teaching of classes, and the travel. And uh, thank you for listening. And I think we're ready for our next slide. And that is Debbie. I am Debbie Hasser, and I, am, I was the curriculum coordinator for uh, 10 years. I worked there for 20, um, and I've been retired for nine years. Uh, and I, but, but I've been a member of the Retirees Association for 10 years. Um, I'm here to talk about volunteering. As I prepared to retire, I thought about the things that I wanted to do, and volunteering was pretty much foremost. Um, at, there are, at the, at the very end, there are links, you'll, you'll have a list of um, opportunities that we've, um, together we've uh, assembled. Um, and at the, at the back of, at the end of the presentation are, are links or phone numbers. So um, you can see um, on this first page, Operation Breakthrough was my, um, was, my, was on my list. And so I have done that for uh, nine years. And uh, as a matter of fact, I've gotten involved, gotten the retirees involved in that. Uh, Anita and Lori and Jonathan have, have uh, uh, spent time and have done things with uh, Operation Breakthrough. And I don't know, Jonathan, do you want to um, speak of some of your um, experiences? Yeah, just briefly, um, I worked in the, uh, the Operation Breakthrough classrooms in uh, Purple 1 and Purple 2, which were one-year-olds and two-year-olds for a couple of years uh, until the pandemic hit. Um, and of course, now they've uh, had to not invite in volunteers. But I do continue to work with a program called Digit Tutors uh, or Digital tr Tutors. And so uh, once a week, I meet with a, a fifth grader uh, over Zoom, and uh, I'm, I help him with his homework, and we read books, and we just chat. And it's, uh, it's a very satisfying experience. I, I've really enjoyed that connection with, uh, with the little ones. Thanks, Jonathan. I, I too, have signed up, but, but haven't, been, I haven't gone through the whole process yet. Uh, I think we're good to go on to the next slide. So I'm not going to talk about all of these, but Habitat for Humanity, Brett Gustafson tells me that two days a week, he volunteers, he does different things, but mostly painting. Uh, and he's done that for several years and feels really guilty if like he misses a day. Uh, KU Meds Alzheimer's Disease Center, I too have volunteered uh, with them for five years. So I finished a 24 month trial and um, they're, I think they're a great organization. They keep you up to date on uh, the new findings. In fact, on a weekly basis, you can do that. You can uh, look that up from your, uh, the last page where the, the link. Let's go on to the next page. So the Johnson County Arts and Heritage Center and Museum. Uh, we have done a lot of their uh, events have attended, done tours, and they, um, it's a great museum. If you're from this area or whatever, I think that you should uh, take a visit. Uh, some of our folks uh, actually did a, uh, a visit recently and it was, uh, the, the protocols were uh, enforced. Uh, a mainstream coalition that was on my list too. Uh, and again, plenty of these others have been suggested by uh, members. Next slide, or are we at the end? Oh. Okay, back to me again. This is Phil Wegman. 
Um, a challenge after you retire is to stay active physically. I guess my story was that as a staff member at the college, I thoroughly enjoyed my noon retreat. I'd go over to the gym, I'd run a couple miles, a shower, come back, go to work. It was perfect. We also had a lot of fantastic staff development activities. We had Steve Javoric's weight training class, all kinds of other classes, yoga, tai chi, and so forth. Super, super kinds of activities. You've all probably taken advantage of those. But again, when you retire, you need to you need to think about how you're going to stay active physically and keep your body in shape. Now, when I first retired, I joined the Lenexa Rec Center, great gym, a lot of good things going on. COVID hit, and that pretty much we ended. And so what I started instead was a walking program. Also decided, found there's lots of great exercise classes on Zoom. And uh, Steve Dvorak had sent home with all of us a weight training program, so you can still do weights at home. But it's a challenge to just, to just to look around and find things to keep yourself active, not just mentally and socially, but physically. So that would be, um, again, a challenge, but something I'd, uh, I'd look into seriously when you retire. Hope this is helpful. Next slide, please. Uh, I'm Jonathan Bacon. I was the, uh, the, my last position at the college was as director of the Educational Technology Center and uh, served at the college in various capacities for 33 years. Uh, I, I'd like to talk to you or share some information with you about the four phases of retirement, what to expect when you're retiring. It's uh, based on a book by Riley Moynes. Um, the, um, he, he talks about four phases being vacation time, loss and lost, trial and error, reinvent and repurpose. Uh, and there's a quote he, he uses, which is on the screen here. Everyone says you've got to get fi ready financially, but also you've got to get ready psychologically. And so that's kind of what I'm going to talk about. Other folks have already talked about the financial aspect. Uh, in North America, uh, these stats are a year or so old, but uh, so they're probably only uh, low but over 10,000 people retire every day. That's about 1,200 people retiring every hour of an eight hour working day. And one of the things that uh, I'm hoping to share with you is the process that people go through, the different phases based on the, the Moines uh, book. Uh, so the first one, let's take a look at phase one. It's vacation time. And you know you're in phase one when you feel a sense of relief exhilaration and accomplishment uh, about your completed work career. It's, it's over with, you're free. Um, you appreciate having no set routine for the moment. You're regularly making travel plans. You are serious about improving your golf game if that's your thing or sampling uh, more barbecue. Uh, you are considering a trophy purchase. It could be anything from a sports car to uh, new golf clubs to a uh, warm weather vacation property. And you look forward to spending more time with your spouse. Uh, hopefully your spouse also looks forward to spending more time with you. You look forward to spending more time at the cottage or at the vacation home or to puttering around the house. So that's, a, that's phase one. It's the state of euphoria. Phase two, uh, which, which hits most people sooner or later is uh, called loss and lost because it's sometimes called the plunge into the abyss of insignificance, or as others have described it, the drop from the top, and is one of the top 10 traumas most humans face in their entire lives. It forces us to immediately create a new routine for our lives. Uh, the freedom for, from routine, the freedom from schedule lasts only for so long, and then, uh, then you find that there's a big hole Phase two is a contrast between our personal identity and professional lives. Our identity, including our accomplishments, our job title, how people view us are intimately connected to our profession or our calling. Further, many of our personal relationships originate in the workplace with our colleagues, partners, or associates. So we're focused, uh, we're forced to address the new reality that puts us at home for longer periods of time than ever before. We now find ourselves invading our spouse's space uh, and their territory, 
wrecking havoc with the routines they've developed over the past 30 or 40 years, while we've been doing the same thing at the office. It's important to not acknowledge that there's a group of people for whom these questions of ego, self-image, and self-worth just don't seem to matter. It's a relatively small group of about 10 to 15%, according to uh, Moynes. Uh, these are the people deeply involved with volunteer activities. And in many cases, they've created a structure and meaning in their lives that's entirely separate from their work career. Um, so again, if we have had a healthy work, uh, personal relationship through our lives, then this loss, lost stage or phase may not hit us quite so hard. Once we retire and are no longer seen at work, we, are often, we often feel like we're just men or women on the street or in the community that nobody knows. Uh, researchers report that 85% of us attach a strong sense of importance, to the structure, identity, relationships, purpose, and power we receive from our jobs. The five inevitable losses associated with phase two have been documented to lead to bouts of depression, family stress, including family breakdown and divorce, alcoholism, drug abuse, and other stressors. So it's important to recognize that stage of loss and lost. Next comes phase three. Um, you know you're in phase three when um, trial and error becomes your mode of operation. You begin to ask yourself, how can I still contribute? When you actively explore options that will allow you to make contributions and to feel good about yourself, uh, that's, that's part of phase three. Uh, we want to always make a contribution. And when you commit to a specific venture, uh, that's uh, another signal of phase three. Uh, during phase three, you might, might, uh, might be prepared to go back to the drawing board, or you should be prepared to go back to the drawing board when your venture or choice doesn't work out. The human brain is wired to continually set and achieve goals. That's what it's always attempting to do. That is best when allowed to stretch into new territory. And that's phase three, trial and error, to see what fits this new existence we have in, in retirement. Well, phase four focuses on reinvesting and repurposing uh, our life focus. It's important to appreciate that not everyone reaches or even wishes to reach phase four. Uh, while almost everyone reaches phase two of retirement, not everyone gets past the loss and the lost stage. Uh, my personal experience is that phase four almost always involves some sort of service to others. And that, um, when Debbie asked me to talk a little bit about Operation Breakthrough, that's where I found that meaning, that new venture. Uh, in volunteerism, not only with the JCCCRA, the Retirees Association, but I'm now active with my Homeowners Association, which I, I was not before I retired. And I'm continue to be active with the church and, uh, and of course, Operation Breakthrough. So those kinds of things give my life structure. You'll find your own. Uh, your list may be completely different. There's a Harvard study a longitudinal, longitudinal study, I can't even say it, um, done over a 20-year period that interviewed over 15,000 retirees. One of their key findings was the unhappiest retirees had not gone on to do anything productive beyond pleasing themselves. It was all about them all the time, which is basically phase one for sure. And that we're not saying there's anything wrong with phase one. It's just that, as with everything, balance in your life helps. You know you're in phase four when you identify your unique ability. You review, or review your life's high points and use them as a springboard. You combine your unique ability with your life's high points to identify and verbalize your life purpose. So again, it's, it's a matter, again, of finding a new meaning for life that extends beyond the workplace. You find your sweet spot. Uh, the, the specific venture, venture that combines your strengths and passions and your desire to make a difference. That's what you're after in that fourth phase. You take action to put all, it all into motion and create a new structure for your life, a new identity connected to your passion, new relationships, renewed purpose, a sense of enhanced power to make good things happen for you and for others. 
So those are the four phases, vacation time to loss and lost to trial and error, and hopefully to finally to reinvention and repurposing. And again, some people never get beyond phase one. It's not always sequential and it may be a continual process. Uh, I think during my 10 years of retirement, uh, I have gone through this process at least a couple times and each person's path uh, may be different. I hope that information on the four phases of retirement will be helpful to you. Um, I know that uh, after reading Boy's book, uh, it helped me better understand what I was experiencing in the early years of my retirement. And so thank you very much for uh, letting me share this information with you. Hi there, my name is Lori Vogelsberg and I retired from JCCC in 2013 as an administrative assistant in the Student Success and Engagement uh, branch after 34 years. Um, JCCCRA is a great place for our retirees. We plan a number of events throughout the year, including uh, tours of locations around Kansas City, movies, lunches, as well as all of the activities with our special interest groups. Prior to the arrival of COVID-19, we had several activities planned, some of which we had to cancel and some we did not. Next slide. Debbie, you have to unmute yourself. <laughs> Thank you. Mm -hmm. So Debbie Hasser, again, we visited Strawberry Hill Museum and Cultural Center, which was a, a home turned into an orphanage from the early 1900s until 1988. And it, uh, we toured the historic St. John the Baptist Catholic Church. Next slide. To get us in the holiday spirit, Diana Ryan, professor of the floral design program, helped us make beautiful uh, holiday centerpieces. Next. And here we are at the cultural or the culinary center of Overland Park. We were able to get together at the uh, at that culinary Kansas City Culinary Center for their pop up lunch. They have a different chef chosen uh, chosen menu each month. Next slide, please. We got together and learned a few games and had lots of laughs. Then the pandemic hit. Since then, it's been a challenge for us to come up with new and creative ways to gather and still keep our distance. But as you can see, we've managed. These are just some of our 2020 events, pandemic style. Next slide. Our fall vegetable planting Zoom class uh, was led by master gardener, Jennifer Stefanczyk, who shared information about container gardening, gardening for fall, what to plant and when, and how to care for the vegetables. Next. And there's Stu Schaefer, Professor of Sustainable Agriculture. He gave us uh, an on-campus tour of part of the JCCC Sustainable Program. They allow eight, eight uh, uh, attendees and we plan to do it again in uh, the spring. Next. Our special interest groups have also been active throughout the pandemic. We have crafts, photography, technology, wine, genealogy, and barbecue. Next slide. We got together at Antioch Park for a barbecue slash gas presentation by Dave Ellis. He shared the history of JCCC's legendary gas group, the Gastronomical Appreciation Society, that visited over 145 barbecue restaurants in the KC area. Their love of barbecue took them to Memphis, Austin, and even London. Next. This is the wine of the month happy hour. New, uh, never, never missed a beat. Thanks to Lyle Craybill and his wife, Terry LaRocca, folks gathered on Zoom to taste, learn about the different wines every month or so. Yeah, it was every month. When we could meet in person, there were as many as like 38 of us. This is by far the best attended group we have. Next. 
Thanks to Jelaine Crabtree, the genealogy SIG met online and learned a number of tools for researching family history, including basic researching skills, local resources, and keeping track of documents. Next. Thanks to Jonathan Bacon and Dick Stein, our JCCCRA chats on Zoom have met eight times in the past few months. This particular photo is from the best, unique, and little known places chat where members shared photos of places they visited here in KC and around the uh, country. Next slide. This chat session focused on the walking, hiking, cycling trails of Johnson County. Jonathan Bacon and others shared information about a, a great resource we have in the county with all of the hiking and biking trails and some of the unique characteristics they offer. Next. The KC Metro Landmarks and Urban Murals chat session highlighted what a great metropolitan area we live in. Participants shared photos of some of the amazing landmarks unique to KC. And this was all by Zoom. Next. This chat slash photo sig was Kansas Beauty in All Seasons and there were two sessions. This showed the beauty of the plains, the sparkling rivers, the wooded areas, and so many other beautiful sites that Kansas has to offer. Plus, we had five additional chat sessions, two craft projects, three yoga sessions, and one community service project that rounded out our 2020 year. We even managed to get in a general meeting on Zoom and a Zoom session to reminisce about all the great memories we have of JCCC. Next slide. We believe that 2021 will give us more opportunities to continue to visit locations around KC, socialize with former co-workers and meet new friends. Here are just some of the upcoming events and activities for JCCCRA with more being planned all the time. We'd love for you to become a member and join. On January 18th, we have a lunch and learn sponsored by the Black Archives and Humanities Kansas facilitated by Carmelita Williams entitled Free Did Not Mean Welcome. Sally Gordon will introduce us to Tai Chi meditation and Qi Jong. On the 21st, we'll participate in an, another photo uh, SIG with Jonathan Bacon and Dick Stein, 2020 in review. I don't know if we want to review that again, but we'll be there <laughs> one more time. And in uh, later January, uh, Wine of the Month Happy Hour, and they're sampling Conundrum Wine. February 5th, there'll be a JCCCRA book exchange on campus. Uh, in February 16th, we have another genealogy sig, exploring ancestry and family search. And on the 24th, Anita Tebby will give a presentation on the history of Southern Johnson County. Next slide. There are a number of additional events in the works. When plans are finalized, we'll add them to the calendar. A few of them are um, a visit to the uh, Union Station Auschwitz, Auschwitz exhibit in the spring, our master gardener will share creative uses for farmers market foods and a presentation on Shutterfly to create photo books and more. At the end of this presentation, there will be a link to join the JCCC Retirees Association. Once there, you can select join slash donate now. And remember, you can, you can join us before you retire. Next slide. Okay, uh, at this point, we'd like to address some of the questions uh, I'm going to check the chat here and see if um, we can address. Okay, can a spouse also become or belong to JCCRA or be a second on the JCCRA trips? Lori? Yes, the answer is yes. Yep. Um, yeah, we have another question for Ann Kobalaric, and she's interested in knowing what benefit JCCC. I, assuming RA offers, and how do you, how long do you have to work full time at JCCC to earn retirement benefits? Well, that goes back to Capers eligible retirees, and you have to have your eighty five points combination age and years of service. And anybody, uh, yeah, that's if you're if you're Capers one. Oh, excuse me. There's differences now. I forget. That's all right, Lori. I all I want to say is. Uh, if, 
the 85 point rule is applicable to capers one uh, capers two it, it's much more onerous it's uh, age 60 and 30 years of service or age 65 and five years of service so uh, many oh. of you are capers one but capers two is becoming more prevalent okay thank you you bet uh, Rose Davidson had a question about the name of the four phases book again, and it's uh, I will it's at the very end of this presentation. Uh, and in fact, if you look at the URL that's on the screen right now, uh, if you go to that URL, that tiny URL, it has this entire slide presentation, including uh, resources at the very end and the list of volunteer opportunities, which are at the very end also. So the uh, the book title itself is, and I always have to, it's a long one, so I have to look it up. Uh, the Four Phases of Retirement, What to Expect When You're Retiring, and it's by Riley Moynes. There is a question about, uh, could Lynn please share the contact at the SSA and phone numbers? Social Security is Sean Gifford. And 877- Eight nine eight four seven zero five extension two eight three one zero. We will uh, again the the slide presentation is available using the tiny URL that's on the screen now. Uh, we will also share that information on the JCC list uh, and the JCCRA list uh, again in the morning. Here's some, some of the information that's at the end of the slideshow. And again, you'll be able to get this by going to that tiny URL. Well, thank you all for attending. Uh, have a good uh, in-service professional development days and, and a good uh, semester ahead. It was good to see you all. We hope to see you later.